Thank you. We're very excited to be here. So we're very happy to be here. I, um, we were here last year as well. Um, I was. I was uh, spent the majority of my time trying. I was uh, two days away from giving birth, so I looked a little different. And um, I spent the majority of the time trying to figure out what hospital I was going to go to if I went into labor. Um, so I'm very excited about being here and being present. Um, I, I also spent a lot of time in the fabulous pillow room upstairs. I don't know if it still exists this year, but it was great. Um, uh, and we're really excited to bring to you some, um, some important topics, and we're hoping that giving this type of presentation early on in the, um, in the uh, process of getting MDMA for PTSD um, approved, we can all keep some of these ethical concepts in mind. Um, so let's see. So the plan, we're first going to talk about ethics uh, for about half of the presentation. And we're going to go over thought experiments, um, which are really exciting and fun and participatory. So we're hoping everyone joins in and argues like philosophers do. Um, and then we're going to learn how the values in those thought experiments can be applied to um, scenarios such as MDMA for PTSD. And we will help you resolve any inconsistencies in your thinking. <laughs> I just wanted to say, um, along those same lines, <clears throat> when I work with students, I do a lot of teaching at uh, various levels, undergrad and medical school and residency and such. And you know, I think it's really important. I, I, when I work with students, I say, um, you don't necessarily have to have the same values as me, but I want you to think about them, be able to articulate them, kind of. Uh, take the pulse of where you're getting your values from so that way in clinical or research or interpersonal situations You have a framework for evaluating it um, And that's kind of what we're hoping to do here. Hannah's going to really set the stage with um, getting you to reflect on your own values um, Particularly as it relates to fairness and distribution of resources, and then we'll take that and apply that to this idea of um, getting MDMA to people with PTSD and perhaps some other difficulties. So I'll let Hannah start and we'll thank you. All right, so um, first we're gonna talk about fairness and values. Um, and these are animations that are done by my partner, Nate Todeshek, who's in the audience and he's um, usually carrying around our baby, so you'll know who he is if you wanna to talk to him about them. Um, and Dan Wickler, who's an ethicist at Harvard, um, brilliant guy. Um, we worked with him on this uh, to help people um, better understand ethics. So, um, who here, by show of hands, has um, taken a bioethics course in the past or philosophy? Okay, so great, good crowd. <laughs> um, and how about people, how, who has done thought experiments? I know I'm tall, stand up straight. Okay, and has anyone heard of the trolley problem? That's the, probably the most um, popular. <laughs> um, so we're not doing the trolley problem today, but that's uh, just a good example of a famous thought experiment. So you're um, this little guy here deciding whether the trolley is going to run over five people or one person, and there's lots of variations on that. Um, and then you're, you talk about why you've chosen what you're doing. Um, for people who haven't done thought experiments, I want to give a, just a brief intro to them so you know what the point is. Um, so they're hypothetical scenarios. They take out a, a lot of the details, so you can really hone in on your value system. Um, so it might feel like it's a, um, not applicable, but it's very applicable. It just is um, only the essential information um, that you'll need to make this decision. So you learn your values. This is not a math problem. You don't, there's no right answer. If you, if you get more numbers, you're not going to figure out the right answer. It's about figuring out what's right for you. And um, you can ask clarifying questions, but there's no more information to get. OK. Ready? Can we see it? Dr. Anderson and Dr. Baker. 
are the physicians in a ward that has a hundred patients who have a life-threatening illness. There is a drug that can restore each of these patients to complete health. Half the patients need only one pill. The other half need two pills. Unfortunately, Dr. Anderson and Dr. Baker find that the total amount of pills available is 50, and there's no possibility of adding to that number. They must decide which of the patients will live and which will die. Dr. Anderson proposes that all the pills be given to the patients who need only one. His reason is very simple. This is how they can save the most lives. If this course of action is chosen, they will save 50 of these 100 patients. Dr. Baker, however, is concerned that the patients who need two pills would not be treated fairly under Dr. Anderson's proposal. Since the patients are not responsible for needing two pills as opposed to one pill, she thinks that each of them deserves a chance to survive. How should Dr. Anderson and Dr. Baker distribute the pills among these patients? Keep in mind that the patients are basically similar except for the fact that some need one and some need two pills. Also, that giving one pill to the patients who need two won't benefit them at all. So it's very serious music. Dan really didn't want it to sound like a cartoon. He's like, this is serious. We need serious music. So that's what we get. <laughs> um, all right. So I've j I have a slide that just summarizes what the question is. So what would people do? Any ideas? So we have um, a mic that if you want to say what you would do, I would encourage that. Say that again, just for people. Uh, randomly generate a list of uh, the people ranked and go down the list till you've given out all the pills. Anyone do anything else? Okay. I have not heard that one before. That's very interesting. I like it. So ask the patients for their input and decide from there. I would probably try to split the pills equally as much or as equally as possible so that you can hit the people that need one pill and the people that need two pills sort of fairly. Okay. Uh, I would give the 50 pills to the f folks who only need a, a single pill okay. and save pe 50 people and presume uh, an evolutionary act, like, is that work here? Okay. Maybe, <laughs> maybe you could do a lottery and just draw, put everybody in the same category and draw the pills accordingly depending on who's pulling from the lottery. So if somebody gets two pills, they need the two pills that's taken from the same store as opposed to dividing based on what pills they need. Okay. I guess I'd be interested from both of, both of you to, can you describe why you um, picked that? It's hard. I mean, it's, it's tempting to just be like, it's tempting to be, to just say like, well, you should give it to the most people to save the most lives, but then there's this sort of equity thing where you're saying like, oh, due to circumstances outside of your control, we're going to, you have to die. And it's not your fault, it's not my fault, but you have no chance at all. Um, at least with the lottery, like, yeah, the pills may be divided and less people total may live. That's a possibility, but it, but it evens things out in the statistics of it. At least the potential is there for everybody as opposed to preemptively and automatically excluding half of the people on either side. Um, and are you okay, okay with saving less people? <laughs> well, are you not okay? No. Okay, okay. <laughs> it's uh, it's funny to take it there because you take it to a place that's like, well, are you okay killing people? Like, it's the framing of the the question, right? Like, 
are you saving people or are you killing people? I mean, right. I want to say the answer yes is inherent in my explanation, but I want to say no. When you ask me like that, I want to say like, no. <laughs> no, I'm not okay killing people. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's a difficult, difficult But I question. guess the other question is, are you okay with all the two pill people dying, right? Right. That's the other way of... Yeah. And it's like, you can't say no to both of them, but I want to really bad. <laughs> Did, did that's something? why I prep people by saying, no, you can't get more pills, because that's the, if you don't say that, people are like, I need more pills, right, I don't answer, I won't yeah. answer. <laughs> what's with this pharmaceutical company? What yeah. kind of, can we get some more, like, who's making these pills? Burn down the building. Yeah, can we just get some more? <laughs> Anyone else? Did you have something? No. Were all of the participants, were all of the patients the same age, and it's all like... Other, it's other like than needing two pills and one pill, they're the same, yeah. But that does make them different, right? Needing different numbers of pills. Here's a radical idea. Um, I can imagine the possibility of all of these patients sitting in a teepee and deciding th through consensus. Uh, it might take a while, but it would be an interesting process. And what do you think would happen? Who would? Who would I think some people might say they might willfully bow out and say, you know, I, this is a young mother, a young father. You, take the pill. I'll bow out. Do you think there might be bullying towards the two-pill people and say, like, listen? Oh, there would be all sorts of projected uh, ego activity, yeah, transference and blame, and it, it could, it, it would be very insightful. Mm. <laughs> all the people are the same. Yeah. There's no differences of mother's Correct. Yeah. Maybe you should let all of the younger people start because they've had less of a chance to live and they've had fewer years to live. And as an older person, I would feel that that would be maybe a fair way to, to do it. If Interesting. You were valuing that. You're delving into an entirely other uh, ethical debate about ageism. Um, <laughs> I, I wouldn't but, have said that if I had so been younger. <laughs> uh, but I felt I could because I'm an older person and I feel that that is. Now, would you give up your spot whether you are a one pill or a two pill person? I think so. Mm -hmm. okay. I totally concur. That's what I was going to say. Give it to the youngest people first because yeah. they've got more time to spend on earth theoretically with all things being equal so yeah I'd give up my pill as being an older person to a younger okay. person okay you know, although I, all the people all the people we're assuming are the same age but that's good to know if we're ever in a group together <laughs> <laughs> you know my Okay, all right. Hey, sorry. Uh, my first thought was, hey, ask and see who wants to live, you know? Sort of along the lines of what you were saying. But then I thought of my, two of my four kids, they're all teenagers, and two of them are profound altruists, and I can't guarantee that they wouldn't give their pills to somebody else. So I'm, I'm really concerned about that. Okay, interesting. Yeah, I'm worried that. Okay, sorry about that. First off, I was saying I need to talk to her because I work at our local VA and I like, I need this connection. So, but my first thought was, hey, just find out who wants to live, you know, and the people who want to, there are going to be some people, maybe like you and me, who'll say, ah, I give the young people the pills, like, I'm all right, you know. But then I thought about two of my four kids who are very profound altruists, and I think they would totally give their pills to somebody else. So that approach, like, ah, I'm worried about it. Because we might be losing some really beautiful people. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So everyone's exactly the same, except for. Yeah. <laughs> everyone's the same, exactly. So they'll all say, they'll either all say like I don't give my pill to someone else, or they'll all say keep the pill. <laughs> so we'll take a couple more and then we'll go on. We have two more thought experiments. Do we, can we do, do a mic to the back? 
Okay, well. I have the same issue with the thing about people volunteering to, um, sorry, I have the same issue with people volunteering to give the pills away because you're selecting against compassion and altruism. I mean, on this small scale, it might not matter, but if you, if you extend that, you're, you're evolutionarily selecting against kind people. Yeah. And, and I think that that is an issue to consider. I think that's evolution though, right? <laughs> like the people who kill other people live. <laughs> what else? But a good point. Um, do we know who got there first? Like, is there like an order of, I mean, if you got there first, I mean, you just get, we just do it until we run out, right? Like that's. <laughs> right, so maybe the, fir maybe the one pill people are less sick and therefore can get there faster, you know? Uh, what if you give, what if you only give two pills to the one pill or the two pill, but as the chief, you only treat people with two pills at a time? Because that would make you feel better about not having to make a choice. But that's, that's the entire thing. Like, you're trying not to make a choice anyway. You're either going to save 50 people maximum or 25 people minimum. And so this whole thing is about what do you as a clinician choose to live with and how do you value that over these other people's lives? Like, mm -hmm. the most ethical thing is you save 50 lives and you bear the burden of what your job is, or you choose to assuage your own guilt and agency in making this choice and make people choose for themselves not to live. Right. I kind of feel like we actually make these decisions non-actively all the time, like people without resources die all the time and we don't equitably uh, distribute resources. So, I mean, it seems to me that it's a very similar decision that we make all the time, which is that we basically distribute resources to those who we think um, are deserving. And so, most likely, um, if we're thinking we want the most to s survive, then we're probably going to give out the one pill. Um, and But I think that this is not s dissimilar to decisions that we make every day by not really caring about large portions of people in this country all the time. Maybe one <coughs> more comment and then we'll go on to the next. I, I'm over here hiding behind the oh. post. I, oh. I, I have a, a uh, oh. question or comment or a thought. Uh. The, the question involves, I'm assuming that the physicians know in advance who needs two pills and who needs one? Is that Most true? Most likely, yeah. Okay. The uh, comment has to do with the fact that it is the physicians who are making the decisions here, um, which echoes a paternalism that I think is not stable. And the, the, the thought has to do with, does this not uh, presage uh, what the previous commenter said, which was um, the lack of resources among certain groups of people leading them to lack of access relative to other groups of people and how stable is that? So I think in terms of s stability, that is to say, if you writ large this, this thought experiment, it would be unstable in any other way than to allow groups to decide for their own destinies. It would be unstable to allow the groups to decide? I would think, unless you held, withheld information from them that didn't allow them to right, decide. So if information were available to them, it would be unstable to allow a paternalistic, physician-driven decision model. I will come back to that. There's a concept of a veil of ignorance. Do you know of that? It, it's a philosophical con concept about um, n needing to not know who's who and which one you are to make an ethical choice. Um, but really important, yes. Um, okay, so ready for, let's see. So these are the, some of the common, uh, we, we came upon many of these answers. So um, just a show of hands, who said they would give one pill um, to the 50 patients who need one pill? Okay. 
how about everyone, is there anyone who would give all the pills to the two pill patients and save 25 patients? And then how many people would give some sort of lottery? Okay. Great. Next one. One thousand people live on the Pacific island of Buma. Eight hundred live in a village in the coastal plain, and two hundred live in remote highlands. All of the people in Buma are at risk of serious illness from several airborne diseases. A donor has given eight hundred dollars to travel to Buma and vaccinate at least some of the residents to protect them against one of these diseases. When the team reaches Buma, they find that the cost of vaccinating a resident of the village in the coastal plain is $1. With their $800, they could vaccinate all of the 800 people who live in that village. The high cost of transportation on Buma, however, raised the cost of vaccinating individuals who live in the highlands to $4. If they spent their $800 on vaccinating only the people who live in the highlands, they could protect all of them but there are only 200 in this group. They therefore decide that they will use the $800 to vaccinate all 800 residents of the city. Just as the group is preparing to leave the island, they receive a message that the donor has contributed another $800. The response for most members of the group is to prepare to go to the Highlands to vaccinate each of the 200 individuals who had been left unprotected as a result of the earlier decision to vaccinate only people who lived in town. But one member of the group thinks of a new way to use the $800. They can vaccinate the people who live in the village against a second disease. And indeed, there is a second disease that is just as serious as the first, and like the vaccine for the first disease, it would be possible to vaccinate all 800 people who live in the town against the second disease with the same funds it would take to vaccinate the 200 people living in the highlands. Therefore, says this member of the team, the way they spend the second donation of $800 should be exactly the same as the way they spent the first, and they should once again leave those in the highlands without any protection. Which of these courses of action has the strongest ethical justification from your point of view? All right, so we're adding context. <clears throat> so on the first round, how many of you would have given all your resources to the people in the city who are cheaper to treat, easier, you don't have to travel there, you don't have to deal with the mountains? Um, I would, but not for that reason. Okay. For, for the reason that, what would have been the point to give them a vaccination for one disease when they're all going to die from the second disease? So why not give them both vaccinations so most people aren't going to die from either? So we're assuming, we're assuming that they live far enough away from each other, you don't have to, think, have to think of herd immunity. So it's just, there's a disease, and there are people that are cheaper to treat, and people are more expensive and you have two bundles of cash. Um, so would anyone do the city and then the highlands so everyone gets, doesn't get one disease? I would probably lean in that direction, yeah, for the first thing. Yes. Okay. Um, with you, the second disease would get you anyway. Is the point. We're assuming they're a little bit different diseases. Okay. Maybe so one makes you blind and one makes you paralyzed. That <laughs> Can you give the the second vaccine to the Highlanders, and so they only get the second one group get, only gets one vaccine, one group only gets the second vaccine, so that they're protected if, uh, if if the second disease does hit, then at least one group will survive. Sure, but you're so you would but you would give half your resources, to half of your total resources to the city and half to the Highlanders. Yeah, that's that's same. Okay. That's, 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 that's an option. Would so, yeah. So the fact that they don't have. Um, Oh, who am I looking at? Okay. Hi. So the fact that they don't have immunity already means that it must not be naturally occurring in their environment. So I think the next question then is what's the vector for this disease entering it? It's probably the port, right? Which is why you spent your $800 there. If it's not the port. And so then at that point, is 
this this one is I don't have enough information. Right? And, the <laughs> and the first one was this only makes sense as a problem if I'm an individualist. Right. And so it's like this maybe only makes sense as a problem if you don't know where it's coming from, and particularly if it's coming from the outside through the port. Okay. So, well, so I would treat it as a math problem uh, to save as many people as possible. That was one possible. of the rules, right? No math problems. No? No. <laughs> well, that's my solution. Okay, someone else? <laughs> no, but said to go ahead. No. So, uh, but to do that, I need more information. Are these diseases 100% fatal? And are these diseases 100%? If, if you don't have immunity against all the diseases, will you die of one guaranteed? And what the percentage is, so. I don't think you ever have that much information in yeah. medicine. <laughs> yeah, right. No, but you have some. You have some. So you can do some statistical Come talk approach. to me after. We'll discuss it. Okay, so. Oh, sorry. One more. Sorry, back to the overview. If you split the vaccinations and do part in the highlands and part down on the coast, you're saving two communities because some of the people in both places will survive and they will reproduce and you're saving two communities. Whereas if you only do the port, then you're only saving one community is another way of looking at mm -hmm. it. Okay. Thanks. So we're going to go on to the next one, um, just so we don't run out of time. But if there were unsaid things, please come find me and let's debate. Public health officials in a large American city understand that many of the premature deaths occurring among the city's population can be traced back to high blood pressure. These officials allocate some money to addressing this problem among city residents. The first step toward effective intervention is to screen people to find out whose blood pressure is elevated. Unfortunately, the city's funds will not permit the public health officials to screen everyone. They must target their screening programs, choosing the population that offers the best chance to achieve substantial health gains. After much investigation, the department has identified two subgroups in the city who would be good candidates for hypertension screening. The first group are African-American middle-aged males living in the inner city. This is the subpopulation with the highest prevalence of serious hypertension and also the group that suffers the worst health consequences that come from high blood pressure. The second group is a mostly white, much wealthier population living in a comfortable suburb. The incidence of high blood pressure among these individuals is much lower. The potential for improved health among the African-American males in the city center is very high, but hypertension screening is only the first step toward achieving these goals. Those who are identified as having a problem with high blood pressure would then need to see a doctor who would then need to write a prescription for antihypertensive drugs, which the individual would then have to take on a regular basis. Without these later steps, merely finding out that one had a hypertension problem is of no benefit and possibly could even be a burden. Unfortunately, relatively few of the African-American males in the city center who are identified as having high blood pressure would be likely to achieve the maximum health benefit that could result from this screening. Too many of them have no physician. If they have a physician, the physician may be a different individual than the one that they saw in a previous visit, and the lack of continuity of care would reduce the chance of success in lowering their blood pressure. If the doctors write a prescription for a drug, 
the patients may not be able to afford to have the prescription filled. And even if they have the prescription filled, the lack of a steady routine in their lives and the constant stresses of life in the inner city make adherence to this drug regimen problematic. The white collar workers in the suburb, on the other hand, although less likely to have a high blood pressure problem in the first place, are very likely to see a doctor and they're almost certain to take their drugs exactly when they should. The public health officials who conduct this investigation conclude that more people will be saved, more health will be achieved by targeting the white collar workers in the comfortable suburb than the African American middle-aged men in the city center. Which of these groups should the city screen for hypertension? Why? Does this, uh, does this animation make anyone think uh, any differently about the pill question? Um, and what would people do? Maybe just a couple comments, or we can just go on, and uh, I can tell you guys how they relate to I just wanted to add something about how medicine is being practiced today from my understanding of it through my own um, primary health care physician who is an extraordinary woman who within 10 minutes took a look at me and said you've been over prescribed and immediately took me off the blood pressure and the cholesterol medication and she explained to me that the way they're practicing medicine now is it's all about algorithms and the need for your um, for your numbers to fall within those algorithms and that at the time that I was prescribed, my blood pressure was very high due partly to the fact that my age, but mostly because I was under a tremendous amount of pressure. And instead of being monitored, uh, I was immediately put on these drugs because she explained to me if, they, if, the, if the numbers are not, do not fall within the parameters, they are penalized financially. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So this really, I think, puts a whole other slant on this entire question. Mm -hmm. Yep. So yeah, that's and, and I actually get to some of those issues um, at the end of the presentation. Yeah. That's all I really wanted to add. Yep. Um, so I'm just going to talk about some of the things we can take away from these thought experiments, and then we're going to go on to the MDMA for PTSD application. So um, in these thought experiments, we're basically defining who wins and who loses from certain decisions. These decisions are made all the time. Policies are made around these types of questions. Um, and oftentimes, even the people making the decisions don't really know what's at stake. Um, and they're kind of calling into question the conventional economic analysis model of biggest bang for your buck. We have this amount of, um, these amount of resources and we want to save this many people. And they're not considering what are the reasons that certain people might have more health needs, might be more complicated, might be more expensive to treat. Um, so in ethics terms, there's a concept of fairness and another one of goodness. Fairness would take into account some of the aspects that create these inequalities in the first place, um, such as so social determinants of health and past fairness inequalities. And goodness would be a term that is used for um, like people that identify as utilitarians. And they'll say, biggest bang for your buck, all the pills should go to the one pill people, save the most lives, doesn't matter who they are. Um, uh, John Rawls is a philosopher who's amazing. If you feel like reading A Theory of Justice, it's pretty dense. Um, but he explains that social justice, um, it is okay to unequally distribute resources as long as the greatest, greatest benefit goes to the least advantaged members of society. So um, in terms of the 50 pills, it, he's saying it's okay if you give more resources towards the, um, the people that need two pills because that's part of um, social justice. Um, if you don't want to read John Rawls' A Theory of Justice, you can also watch The Good Place, <laughs> which is a great show and talks a lot about philosophy and does thought experiments. There's also a um, children's book called Fair is Fair that we read to our kid, Ezra. Um, and it has a 
um, scenario in which the zookeeper gives different amounts of food to the different size animals, and then they look, they look at their piles and they say, this isn't fair, the elephant gets too much and the, and the rabbit gets too little, and they decide to self-administer fair, fairness, um, and they distribute it equally, and then the elephant proceeds to starve, and the rabbit proceeds to get very fat, and then they realize, wait, we just needed different things. Yeah, exactly. Um, if you care, uh, I, I do have how many people were saved in the 50 pills, and um, I can also talk to you, anyone, about this afterwards, but um, basically, uh, the C and D answers, doing a lottery would be what John Rawls would probably say is the most equi um, fair um, answer because you're actually giving more pills to the two pill people e even if you're saving the same amount of lives on either side. But again, I'm, this is one particular answer. That doesn't mean that utilitarians also have a very good argument. Um, so, the vaccinations, it's mostly just to work on consistency. If you decide to treat the people in the port and then after in the mountains, there's um, some difficulty with that just because you're, you're choosing the most good and then the most fair option. Um, so a philosopher would say, hey, you should really choose, if you have a certain leaning, you should choose the same answer both times. Um, and then the hypertension clinics. Um, a lot of times this helps put into context the concept, even though in the first experiment there, everyone's equal except for needing one and two pills. That is a difference, right? There are people that need more resources in that. Um, and, and, and if you're sort of blindly following that um, uh, approach, then things can happen such as putting your hypertension clinic in the white, white suburb. Um, and that's why it's really important to evaluate all decisions and like who it affects. Um, global burden of disease study uses the concept of disability adjusted life years and it makes they make a lot of decisions um, around the world um, based on this data and the data is just about how many lives are saved rather than what the reason is um, for them to need certain resources and the World Health Organization does have some guidelines about fairness and they say sometimes it is justified to provide greater resources to persons who have greater needs, even if it's um, unequal distribution. Um, and now I'm gonna hand this over to Michelle. Thank you, Hannah. Um, so. <laughs> I mean, right, so there was, uh, Hannah set up the context for that by just making us think about how we'd all go about these decisions um, and what kind of kind of uh, ethics and values we might each use when thinking about uh, any of these kind of thought experiments, but then to be able to ultimately apply them or apply, uh, you know, thinking through those types of problems to more real world scenarios. I think um, as we move into the portion about trauma and PTSD, the third, the hypertension clinic, is really speaking the most truth to us in the real world um, as we go, uh, as we are striving to set up an expanded access clinic in West Philadelphia. So we're gonna, you know, this is very relevant for us. Um, and then, you know, along those lines, uh, particularly relevant, I don't know who here saw the Wall Street Journal article a couple of weeks ago from someone at Penn Medicine, the prior president, um, saying that they should teach less about social justice in schools and that they're making activists instead of, did people see that? Anyone see that? Yeah, so <laughs> we're, yeah, in Philadelphia, so <laughs> here have heard about it a lot, unfortunately. And so the basis of the article was we need to make more scientists and less activists and stop focusing on, was, the title of the article was called um, Take Two Pills and Call Me By My Pronouns. And it was just against, um, you know, I find that a rather uh, stigmatizing and traumatizing, traumatizing thing in and of itself. But so, all of that in the background, now moving on to a bit about trauma, um, PTSD, and then just other effects of trauma. Who in the room um, are clinicians of any sort? Okay, and do most of you, I guess raise your hand if you work with trauma, PTSD? Okay, so I'll, I'll start from the beginning, I guess. Um, 
trauma, um, so in DSM-5, which is, you know, what psychiatrists use um, for clinical, I'm not even really sure what, for probably for billing in most cases. I teach, <laughs> I teach philosophy, um, philosophy of mental illness at an undergrad class, and the first time I opened up the DSM was actually um, to teach it in that class. <laughs> I had to take the plastic off, so it was a little embarrassing. Um, <laughs> but it is important to know, um, oh, also working at the VA, we don't deal with you know, insurance and stuff, so it's less important for these kinds of things. But um, So here are the diagnostic criteria for PTSD in the DSM. Um, and so criterion A is what they call, you have to have a criterion A, which is a stressor. Um, some of these were added in 2013, so um, someone's exposed to death, threatened death, actual or threatened serious injury, threatened sexual violence, they can have direct exposure, they can witness the trauma, or they can learn, for example, that a very close person in their life had experienced it. Um, indirect exposure. Indirect exposure is also um, possible. I'll go quickly. Uh, okay, intrusion, intrusion symptoms, so that's nightmares, flashbacks, unwanted memories, intrusive thoughts of, of those kind of experiences. Um, and then if you're having all of these intrusive thoughts, a lot of people adapt, right? It makes sense that if you have this very uncomfortable um, set of internal experiences that you're gonna want to avoid things that bring about those experiences. So avoidance is another form of um, PTSD or a type of um, symptom, and that is avoidance of stimuli that remind you of the trauma, um, avoiding even talking about the trauma, thinking about the trauma, feelings about the trauma. Um, criterion D is negative alterations in cognition and mood, just think kind of not able to be happy, not able to um, really have an optimistic outlook on life, and criterion A E is the more um, physical kind of symptomatology in terms of hypervigilance, startle reflex, always feeling on edge, those kind of things. So the way things go now is that there's kind of two sets of things that are recommended. Um, I mean, other things are used too, but I would say these are the most common um, recommended. And on the left, those are the therapies, and on the right are um, some of the medications. Those are three SSRIs and one SNRI. Um, but they're pretty, um, the ones on the left are pretty similar in some ways, and, and in none of them are there really even, let alone MDMA-assisted psychotherapy, which is, you know, this particular kind of medicine that we're all excited about. But even with, with these kind of medicines, there aren't really protocols or guidelines for thinking about using them together. People just say, yeah, it's better if you have a little bit of both. Um, and then for things like prolonged exposure, you have to have a very specific type of trauma, like I said, those criterion A traumas, and also have a very specific type of symptomatology to be able to work through a lot of these therapies. So, does anyone know what these two pictures have in common? Does anyone know what either of them are? Hmm? It is Pluto. Thank you. <laughs> all right, all right. Well, if we were in Philly, maybe more people would know. Are people here psychiatrists, anyone? Okay, so on the left is John Fry, who is known as Dr. Anonymous, um, and he dressed up in that mask um, at an APA convention when uh, homosexuality was still in the DSM, and he was very famous, I guess, for um, advocating for taking homosexuality out of being a mental disorder uh, in the DSM. And then bear with me, Pluto, recategorize. So the point of this slide <laughs> is that we, you know, th categories change, and they can have a lot of um, effects on values, people's lives, and they're actually like huge, obviously we understand why it was like that for homosexuality, um, but even for Pluto, I don't know who, if you remember, is like, whoa, Pluto's not a planet anymore. Like everything that I've, yeah, everything I've thought about the world is now, you know, shattered. My reality is broken. Um, so they had kind of a similar sense of vitriol and anima and all of this kind of stuff. So with that in mind, I kind of also just want to think about trauma and what we call PTSD, but what else we can call it or what else we can do with that. 
So right now, like I said, trauma is usually really um, characterized as this significant threat to safety. It's shocking, it's overwhelming. DSM-3 said, distress in almost anyone. That was the quote, remember DSM-3. I, I really don't know the statistics, but I imagine that it was mainly older white males that um, constructed that book. So we have to think of what kind of distress they were thinking about and what kind of distress they were leaving out. Um, and we know so much about different times of trauma and all the characteristics that might vary about it. Um, and subthreshold PTSD, so PTSD that might have some of those symptoms, but maybe miss one of those categories, not have the avoidance. Because for instance, in subthreshold PTSD, if people are having a lot, of, um, a lot of symptoms, arousal is much more common than the avoidance um, if someone doesn't have the full criteria of PTSD, and in, there aren't a lot of studies about this, and particularly there aren't studies on um, treatment for subthreshold PTSD, but there is study that we know it's associated with a huge burden of distress, with psychological impairment, with other health impairment. There's a wasp on my eye. Um, so it's important, right, just because someone doesn't reach this kind of magical threshold, and it's almost kind of what she was saying about um, the blood pressure numbers, right? There's, they're in some way predictive. We're getting lots of different messages. He just, okay. I think we might not do questions. <laughs> okay. All right, so there might be just some arbitrary cutoffs. If you have two of these symptoms, you can make it into having PTSD and then you're eligible for this treatment and then insurance is gonna reimburse, but what if that doesn't happen, right? Like what if you have 10 of the arousal characteristics but none of the avoidance? What does that mean? You're not like sick enough? What are you entitled to? What if, what if you're in more distress even than someone who just nice, nicely fits into this criteria? Um, so I'm gonna go. Um, so what I'm talking about is the fact that just talking about PTSD as a social construct doesn't mean that it's not real, right? People think that when you talk about something that's socially constructed, it means that it's not real, but it actually doesn't mean that at all. It can mean that our associations, connotations, and the way that we use it is socially constructed. So I always use the example of money. If you have a coin, a quarter, and you say this is 25 cents, that, that value is socially constructed. That's 25 cents, but the quarter is there, right? That exists in the world. So all of these things, these experiences, these traumas, these symptoms, they are there. We're just socially constructing who is eligible for certain things and what it means and what we kind of validate as a true, um, as a true, I guess, disorder. Um, so what we want to talk about very quickly is the fact that um, what if people are experiencing a lot of traumas every day, something that doesn't add up to full PTSD, that isn't, you know, you got threatened at gunpoint, but is living life with maybe chronic daily microaggressions. What are those symptoms gonna look like? Um, and what can we do to help? particularly with the context of MDMA-assisted uh, psychotherapy. Yes. Um, so I think we're probably just gonna skip over the questions. If you guys have questions, come find us after, because we'll just go all the way up to 11. Um, so I uh, got interested in the concept of microaggressions. I have dyslexia, and I sort of was trying to figure out some of the um, some of the experience of people with cognitive differences and how there are these like daily stressors that don't necessarily count as like an index trauma, but over time re are really stressful. Um, and uh, the statistic is that 17% of adult women with um, dyslexia will attempt suicide. So it's real, it's, um, but it's not necessarily what we're gonna call PTSD. Um, so if you think of, um, so these are, so we're gonna give like four examples of ways in which uh, certain groups are left out of the um, diagnosis of certain diseases such as PTSD and then treat and then they don't have access to treatment. Um, so if you think of uh, microaggressions as like a toxin um, and something like asbestos might add up over time, you get a cough and then you get asthma and then you get higher rates of cancer, microaggressions add up to something serious, but each each um, step is just a small step. So maybe it's anger, sadness, self-doubt, but the, it becomes what Daryl Wing Su, who uh, writes about microaggressions, um, calls a death by a thousand paper cuts. Um, 
So the way toxins build up in your system have certain um, curves, and I think microaggressions probably have a similar thing. People experience them over time and have different symptoms at different speeds. Um, so this may be a way that it could look like symptoms are slow and then they go, they go up and they um, become, then they plateau um, and eventually become inability to function. Um, I actually asked someone to, I, I was teaching this and um, asked people to draw what they thought the curve would look like and someone drew this and handed it back to me. So no symptoms, no symptoms, self-harm which kind of blew my mind, right? So it's like building up in your system and then eventually the person can break, um, which is important to think about. Um, do you wanna talk about that one? Yeah, I was just gonna say along those lines of it building up and building up and building up to a tipping point, um, I had you know, seen of that, uh, this graph right here from Hannah, um, but it kind of reminded me of the fact, what are we validating by saying that only certain kinds of trauma qualify for PTSD? Um, and so how also by some kind of, you know, whatever this patriarchal or biomedical industrial research complex, what are we doing by saying that, um, that there are only certain valid kinds of trauma and only valid kind experiences of distress from trauma that deserve certain kinds of treatment? So if we're sitting here denying and minimizing um, those kind of microaggressions um, from a point of authority or a point of, you know, perceived uh, knowledge base or more knowledge base than someone else's lives. You can imagine why uh, a person might go along life feeling like that too, these experiences, their own kind of denying and minimizing and rationalizing until it just builds up. Are, are we in some way um, causing or supporting that, that, that trajectory as well? Um, and I think just in general, we um, are thinking a lot about race and trauma because we're hoping to have our expanded access um, site in West Philadelphia. Um, and so the patient population and the community that we want to serve, I don't think um, a lot of them will maybe have criterion A traumas, um, but a lot of them might not as well. And so we wanna make ourselves um, you know, in line with the protocols and everything of MAPS but to make ourselves and think early about how we can, um, we can make uh, this available for them. Um, so that's why one of these kind of differences that we're talking about is race and the experience of chronic daily microaggressions um, in terms of race and the experience of um, people that are living in our community. And, um so another, do you want to talk about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, another thing that we're thinking about in terms of how um, people might not neatly, nicely, cleanly fit into that category of PTSD is just people with cognitive differences. Let's say someone with autism, not only might they have different kinds of microaggressions or experiences, or even if they do have criterion A traumas, how also are they able to explain and put into a narrative? Something like prolonged exposure, you need an index trauma, you're gonna work through that through narrative, you're going to tell this story, but what if your ability to tell a narrative or process trauma is different than this kind of model that we're putting forth? This is what happens in trauma. You have this index trauma, you react to it a certain way, and then you get these set, if you're sick enough, you have these set of symptoms that are therefore eligible for medication or for therapy. But it, someone with cognitive differences, um, someone who might not, might be neurotypical, might um, you know, express, experience them in different ways and that would make it hard for them to connect with treatment because they're not the clean, easy, nicely packaged form of PTSD that a lot of the studies and, and providers to tell you the truth are looking for. Um, other challenges are out-of-pocket payments. So um, in expanded access, it will be out-of-pocket. Um, and then after FDA approval, we'll still have people that are uninsured. Um, and looking at fairness from that perspective, are we only, you know, are we pr preferencing people who already are better off? This is a problem not just in, of course, in this study, but in all across this country and the world. Um, better outcomes when we do studies. We're often um, having exclusion and inclusion criteria that excludes people that are too complicated or will make the data confusing to interpret. Um, and if we don't have those groups, the problem is, is we don't know if they are, um, how much they benefit from that therapy. They need to be part of that data set to really um, inform us about the efficacy. 
And then um, also it's just, you know, this kind of battle of uh, really being excited and we're all so excited to get this approved and sometimes when we've spoken about this people have said well let's just get it approved first and then we'll worry about that but I think that's kind of the history of medicine and biomedicine um, in general is okay we'll just do this thing and then we'll worry about the marginalized populations but we we want to say like let's think about it first because you know that's not going to happen later on down the line once it's approved then it goes out into the world what we need what we're really hoping for and we're very excited about approval but also, you know, to pay attention to other characteristics and we have someone, you know, at least at first with maybe an index trauma, but also microaggression so that we can, you know, see how, how their experiences change with this form of medicine as well. I feel like we, we have one mic. I feel like we should break, break out into song at the end of here. Um, so final thoughts and then I have a bonus slide. It's exciting. So know your values. Learn how to apply them in real world situations. Know what the implications are as much as you can. Structural and institutional racism, ableism, et cetera, are everywhere in our, in our books, in our protocols, in it's hard to fight, but we're here to fight it. Um, and we are, I'm really excited that we're, we're all in on the ground floor, that we can potentially make this difference in this therapy and really work together to make it happen. Um, like, let's start again. Let's do it, do a new version. Um, so it, the final thing is a project uh, Nate and I have now started about um, animations to enhance inclusion about MDMA-assisted psychotherapy specifically. Um, so we're, we originally have been talking with MAPS about doing something with informed consent to make sure people understand the pros and cons of joining a study and what the side effects are and make sure it's like um, easily understandable. But more and more we're realizing that where we're losing people is probably even earlier. Like, what is MDMA? Like, is it illegal? Can I really get into a study? And then even what is trauma? Like, people have to recognize their symptoms as something that has a name to Google. Like, what are the new therapies for this thing I'm experiencing? Um, so we're working on these animations to help people just understand what is even trauma. Um, and here's a... Not that they can be invited to things like this, because looking out, yeah. there's um, so here are some of the the um, the some pictures of the animations that we're working on, and this is Nate over here that's that's uh, doing them. So we're really excited. If you have input or thoughts, please come talk to us. Um, and this is Nate's over here who did the animations. Dan Wickler's my professor at Harvard. And Ken Weiss is uh, one of my forensics mentors who taught me a lot about what doesn't uh, that that nature can't be. Uh, Cleaved at the joints and PTSD is not the only response to trauma. And that's it. With one minute to spare. Yeah.